On this edition of 219 West, troubled waters, could this be coming to a faucet near you? Hollywood actor Mark Ruffalo is taking a stand in the battle. I'm not some actor who just is like coming on because this is a pet project of mine. I live there. I've seen it. Vanishing languages. Ever hear someone speaking Kabardian <laughs> or Mamuju? <laughs> They're among the 800 languages spoken in the city, and they may be in danger of extinction. We will begin a series on how New Yorkers are trying to save them. Market for men. Beauty secrets and beauty treatments are not only for women these days. How sales of male cosmetics and skin products are soaring. Hello, and welcome to the beginning of our second season of 219 West, the monthly news magazine produced by students at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for CUNY TV. I'm David Montalvo. And I'm Courtney Carter. Also on this edition of 219 West, the midterm elections. Good news for Republicans, and what do they mean for Obama? We'll talk to the Daily Beast political columnist, Peter Beinart. But before we look at the national scene, we'll start closer to home. There's a famous saying, all politics is local. In next month's election, New Yorkers will choose a senator, 11 representatives, and all 91 seats in the Albany legislature. In the Bronx, which has the largest Puerto Rican community outside of the island, political dynasties seem to be bucking the trend of anti-incumbent anger. Amy Yancey explores the political legacy of Puerto Ricans in the Bronx and what lies ahead. Politics in the Bronx can be a family business. Names like Rivera, Espada, and Diaz are synonymous with politics in the borough. Ruben Diaz Sr. serves on the New York State Senate. His son is the Bronx Borough President. I love my father dearly. We don't always agree, but certainly I benefit as a young man uh, from having a father figure there, from having uh, someone who's been involved in, in public service. That's something he believes is part of our country's history. I think that when you look at political families, that's been part of our culture as Americans. Uh, you look at the Adams, uh, uh, you know, our founding fathers. You look at the Kennedys. Uh, look at the Bushes, right? Uh, no one ever questioned nepotism, but nobody ever questions that, right? The Kennedys had Boston. Puerto Rican dynasties have the Bronx. <laughs> Following the arrival of U.S. troops in Puerto Rico in the late 19th century, Puerto Ricans began migrating to New York City in large numbers. They populated the Bronx because it had more affordable housing than other boroughs. It also had a well-established Puerto Rican community. And with numbers, then comes a certain responsibility to want to better your community, and of course, you become politically mature. Because their native country is the United States Commonwealth, Puerto Ricans are the only Latino group with automatic citizenship. And citizenship gives them a very important right. A Puerto Rican could have just arrived the day before from San Juan and could still uh, be a voting uh, force. Puerto Ricans don't just cast votes. They are often on the ballot. The last three Bronx borough presidents are of Puerto Rican descent. As people say, demographics is destiny. Uh, people think that uh, changing population representation of different groups shifts the political power away from the long-standing groups. Sometimes political dynasties fall apart. Pedro Espada Jr. serves on the New York State Senate, and his son, Pedro G. Espada, was an assemblyman. Both were marred by charges of ethics violations. The son resigned last year, and the father was trounced in September's primaries by Gustavo Rivera. This Rivera isn't part of the politically powerful Rivera family, Jose, Joel, and Naomi, but admits that name association did not hurt him. Rivera is like the Smith of the Puerto Ricans. Everybody's got that last name. The primary winner doesn't think political dynasties are the problem. The measuring stick should be whether they serve their constituents well. But the names on the ballots are starting to change. The number of Puerto Ricans in the Bronx only dropped one-tenth of a percent between the years 2000 and 2008. But the number of Dominican Bronxites went up about six percent during the same time frame. Dominicans are becoming more involved with Bronx politics. 
Yudelka Tapia is a Dominican community activist. She was elected district leader in September. Dominicans like two things. It is baseball and it is politics. The Dominican community are players in the world of politics here in the Bronx and in the city. Both in the Caribbean and in New York City, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans are neighbors. If they focus on shared political interests, it might not be long before a Latino candidate achieves citywide success. That's something no Latino has been able to do. I think we need to come together as a community. It's time to look at us as candidates. It's time to look at the substance of the candidate, the issues, uh, and, and that ethnicity is secondary. If so, Latinos in the Bronx could find there's more political power in diversity than in dynasties. For 219 West, I'm Amy Yancey. The winds of change are also heading to Harlem, once the center of black politics in New York City. As Walter Smith Randolph reports, right now those winds are more like a light breeze. For the better part of a century, Harlem has been a political center of New York's 15th congressional district, dominated by an African-American majority that has re-elected Charlie Rangel for four decades. That's not about to change overnight, with voters still going with what they've known for most of their lives. So I actually voted on familiarity rather than any uh, character or uh, character issues, you know, uh, political issues, you know. So political analysts are not pointing to any sudden changes soon. The, the district's political uh, culture and establishment still is, the political clubs are still controlled by blacks. The district leaders are still overwhelmingly black. So that's, that will, that could erode over time, but it's not immediate. But Muzio and other political analysts do see big changes coming down the road, and you already can see why on the streets of the district. Demographics is destiny. If you've got lots of Latinos and lots of white gentry moving in, that political dynamic is likely to change. Uh, well, you're talking about the increasingly gr uh, growing power of Dominicans uh, to the north and, and west. Um, the Upper West Side, which is growing more white by the day, the, the Upper West Side of Manhattan used to be a pretty um, integrated, uh, uh, both economically and racially and ethnically. But the um, fastest growing percentage of children in Manhattan are white children. Between 1990 and 2008, the black population in the congressional district decreased by 24,000. During the same period, the white non-Hispanic population increased by 25,000 and the Hispanic population increased by 50,000. Given the demographic change where uh, Latinos are now the predominant, uh, in terms of numbers, predominant group within that congressional district. I mean concretely, I don't know, but change is common. Uh, to quote a famous song from the 60s, something's happening here, what it is ain't exactly clear, but something's happening. Odds are that Rangel's re-election next month is a fairly safe bet. Nobody, however, is taking bets on who or what comes further down the road. As the neighborhoods of the 15th District, Harlem, Inwood, Washington Heights, the Upper West Side, and the South Bronx continue to change, all bets are off. For 219 West, I'm Walter Smith Randolph. While Rangel's seat might be safe, that can't be said about many of his fellow Democrats across the country. Recently, I sat down with political analyst and CUNY professor Peter Beinart to talk about his predictions for November and beyond. So, Peter, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. And so let's get to it. You wrote an article in the Daily Beast, a very interesting article, saying, let's face it, Republicans are going to take it in November. Why do you think that? First of all, whenever one party wins a couple of elections in a row, as the Democrats did in 2006 and 2008, they usually tend to lose after that because you w pick up a lot of seats in districts that traditionally the other party holds. And usually when the tide recedes, some of those incumbents lose. Also, when one party controls everything, in Washington, and the economy is very, very bad, and people are in a bad mood, it's not surprising they would punish the people in power. You wrote a very interesting quote. Uh, the Republican Party is like a sinner who repents every Sunday without quite remembering Saturday night. 
What does that mean? My point was that when the Republican Party is in power, it spends a lot of money. It really doesn't try to cut popular middle-class government spending programs like Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid because uh, Republicans in power realize that people really like those things. But then when the Republican Party loses power, Republicans decide that the essence of being a Republican is to try to cut the size of government. So you see this cycle where when Republicans, just after they lost, when George W. Bush lost, they all of a sudden rediscovered the old-time religion of cutting government. But there was a reason George W. Bush hadn't tried to cut government, because the public doesn't like it. And I think we're about to go through that cycle again when they win this fall. So with all these, these so-called sinners, let's say, do you think the Republicans can take the House and the Senate? I think conventional wisdom is that they're likely to take the House, probably less likely to take the Senate. Um, uh, my experience is in these wave elections, 1994, 2006, that in general the party that has the wind at its back picks up at least as many seats as the pundits suggest it will. So I think uh, they have a very, very good chance in the House, and I think the Senate's not out of the question. Okay, so let's switch gears for a second to the Democrats. Rangel kept his seat. Why do you think that is? Or what lessons does that, does that mean for us? Well, I think it's um, entrenched incumbents um, uh, like Charlie Rangel, who have a lot of resources at their disposal, are very difficult to beat. Um, uh, even with all the personal problems? Even with all the personal problems. It would be a different thing if Charlie Rangel were in a competitive district where the Republicans could field someone in the general election. But there are no Republicans in his district virtually. Um, so all he had to worry about was, was the primary. And I think there is um, a lot of people in that district feel that Rangel has delivered for them over the years. And I think, in general, you tend to find, as a general, it's, it's an exaggerate, it's a, it's a kind of stereotype, but I think, in general, you find that, that African Americans incumbents are particularly difficult to beat in Why primary elections. I think because, I think because there's a, a loyalty to, to, to them as a result of their service, and I think people value that. Let's talk about another, another Democrat real quick, uh, President Obama. So if the Republicans win, all his work may go out the window. No, I don't think it'll go out the window. I mean, uh, Republicans would love to repeal health care reform, but they're not going to be able to do that. That is a massive accomplishment that will stand. Uh, uh, and the Republicans won't be able to do anything about it. The stimulus, even though it wasn't as large as I would have liked, was a quite a large infusion of government dollars into things that Democrats tend to believe in, like, like uh, energy efficiency and public transportation. I don't think they're going to be able to repeal that either. So he, the financial reform. So he actually notched up a lot of victories, I think, in his first two years, and I don't think the Republicans will be able to undermine those. Okay. So let's switch gears to the Tea Party, a uh, very big, powerful force right now. What do you think Republicans are thinking about the Tea Party right now? I think some Republican strategists are a little bit concerned, but I don't think, frankly, their views matter all that much. I mean, this is where the energy is uh, on the Republican base. You have basically a mobilized group of angry, essentially older white voters um, who are angry because the economy is very bad, and they're, or, and they're angry because they find President Obama, for various reasons, to be threatening in various kind of ways. And they are essentially taking over the grassroots of the Republican Party. I think the problem Republicans will have is that if you look at the demographics of the United States, older, angry, grumpy white people are not really enough to win presidential elections anymore. Their percentage of the population is going down and down because of the rise of the Hispanic population and also because of this huge younger generation, the millennials, larger than the baby boomers, who are actually, in, who are much more, tend much more towards the Democratic Party. So I think the problem is that the Tea Parties may actually prevent, seduce the Republicans into believing that they're doing well, whereas I think actually they've still not made inroads with the key demographics they need to win. So who do you think is going to have the biggest influence in this, this campaign season? The younger generation, the older, I know you said the older it doesn't have as much, you know, influence, but minorities, what do you think? In the midterm elections, okay. where you tend to find that youth turnout goes down, and particularly this midterm election, I think probably minority turnout will go down. Remember, it was very high because of President Obama. It won't be nearly as high probably in 2010. That's why I think they're part of the reason Republicans will do so well. But in 2012, when President Obama is on the ballot, that's when I think you will see African American and Hispanic turnout reassert itself. Younger voters will be an even larger share of the population, and because they are such a diverse and culturally tolerant group compared to older voters, they tend to lean Democratic. Hispanics have been pushed even more into the Democratic Party by the immigration debate. And that's when I think we'll see that the Tea Party, while interesting to watch, does not actually represent majority sentiment in this country. So what is your prediction that Obama will win big? 
incumbency carries a lot of weight. I think these demographic advantages will also reassert themselves in 2012. And I think the economy, although it won't be great, will probably there will be more sense of optimism and hope then than there is now. Thank you for joining us, Peter. My pleasure. Critics say a method used to extract natural gas from underground could pose a threat to New York's water supply. Between a rock and a wet place in just a moment. New York City's tap water is considered to be among the best in the nation, but that reputation may be in jeopardy, all because of an environmental controversy more than 100 miles away. Jessica Cordemanche has more. Whoa. The new documentary Gasland says this is what might happen as a result of a natural gas drilling method called fracking. Fracking, or hydraulic fracturing, is a method of releasing natural gas trapped under rock formations. Water, sand, and chemicals are forced at high pressure into these rocks, causing tiny fractures. These cracks allow the gas to escape so it can be recovered. I have these lesions in my brain. You get pains, pains all over your body. Obviously, we have a problem here. Gasland claims that the chemicals used, some of which are toxic, can contaminate the water table. That happens not due to the fracking. Unfortunately, there are some other issues which can contribute to pollution of the, of the drinking water with methane gas. Konstantin Kranganu is a geology professor at Brooklyn College. He disagrees with the documentary. So you're telling me that there's zero probability that any of the chemicals they inject or the gas would seep back up those four layers. Th there is no such the thing like a zero probability, <laughs> but a very low probability. A very low probability. With all, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, due respect uh, to my uh, you know, geological colleague at uh, Brooklyn College, I would tend to disagree with him. James Gennaro is a New York City councilman who is also a geologist. He's concerned because an area that has been identified as having large deposits of natural gas lies right beneath the primary source of New York City's drinking water. It's called the Marcellus Shale, and it stretches from West Virginia to southern New York. Councilman Gennaro is calling for a statewide moratorium until federal studies about the safety of this practice are complete. Unless and until we do the science, there is no science. And so that's what has to be done. We shouldn't be speculating. We shouldn't be hoping that this won't cause uh, adverse consequences. Uh, we shouldn't be, you know, sloganeering. We should be studying and we should be regulating. Proponents of fracking, however, are saying that the process is safe and that the time to drill is now. Chris Tucker represents the gas industry advocacy group Energy in Depth. You're talking about New York, a state with 900,000 people out of work, uh, about a $9 billion shortfall, um, and just a, 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 the potential to produce in, in upstate, um, you know, a, a part of the country, a part of the state, part of the country that could certainly use a boost in Marcellus production in Broome County. Again, one county in, in New York could potentially create 16,000 jobs in one county. The documentary Gasland shows people who say they've become sick because of fracking in their communities. Tucker says these claims are overblown. It is a manufacturing process, um, and you know you have to be, do it the right way, or you know you're going to have folks sort of look at that one case and say, well, look at that, the whole process is, is unsafe, even though you know we, we literally have 480,000 natural gas wells in, in, in the country, and you know 99.999999 percent of them are operated the right way and produce natural gas that, that the country needs. Josh Fox, the director of Gasland, is not convinced. Their main argument is saying that it's, it might be possible that the health problems and, you know, all the unusual occurrences that we see in your movie uh -huh. might not be directly related to fracking. It might be isolated incidents. How do you respond to that? Well, <laughs> they've drilled something between 1,400 and 1,800 Marcellus wells in Pennsylvania. They've got 1,435 violations. That's not isolated. That's everywhere they go. And that's what I've seen. Everywhere they go, they have problems. Josh Fox has become the commanding general in the battle against hydraulic fracturing. In the process, he's enlisted the help of prominent politicians and celebrities. One of his leading foot soldiers is actor Mark Ruffalo, who has a home near the Marcellus Shale. 
I'm not some actor who just is like coming on because this is a pet project of mine. I live there. I've seen it. Legislation to impose a moratorium on fracking is currently making its way in Albany. And there are several studies looking into the environmental impact on the watershed areas upstate, where much of the water we drink begins its journey. For 219 West, I'm Jessica Cordemosh. Recently, researchers in Washington, D.C. announced they have discovered a new language. It is called Koro, and it's spoken by about 800 villagers in northeastern India. But even as new languages are being uncovered, others are moving toward extinction. In the first of a series, Jonathan Balthaser takes a look at one local group's efforts to keep these little-known languages alive. Listen to New York City. There are 800 languages spoken in the five boroughs. Some are very familiar. But how about Kabardian? Or Mamuju? Or this language? That's so, a Taiwanese language also spoken in New York. It, along with 90% of the world's languages, are in danger of extinction by the end of this century. Daniel Kaufman is trying to prevent that. We're losing not only uh, an enormous part of human culture when, when these last speakers die, but also, as I said, a real window into the mind. As the director of the Endangered Language Alliance and a linguist at the CUNY Graduate Center, Kaufman locates, records, and documents vanishing languages. When the last speaker dies, it's not as if uh, the whole tribe or a whole race disappears. The people are still there, but they lose, uh, uh, they lose this link to their history. Jesus Santana speaks Almuzgo, an indigenous language of southern Mexico. Santana is one of 10,000 speakers of a language that he fears will one day disappear. My wife doesn't speak Almuzgo, and my daughter doesn't speak Almuzgo either. So if I don't teach my daughter to speak the language, it'll be lost. Santana comes to the Alliance every Sunday. He and Kaufman, along with volunteers, spend hours creating a permanent record of Almuzgo. Despite the work of the Alliance, globalization is quickening the pace at which these endangered languages are dying off. Many people don't really make the choice. It's sort of made for them by governments, by schools. They're sort of pushed into speaking uh, a major world language. That's what James Lovell says is happening to his native language of Garifuna, spoken in Belize and along the Caribbean coast. I'm appealing to the, to the Garifuna parents to teach the language, the Garifuna language, to the children. We do. Right now, he says, the language isn't being passed down among generations. Their parents thought that it was better or it was more beneficial to, to learn Spanish or English. They didn't see the importance of speaking Garifuna. Lovell is trying to preserve the music, history, and culture of Garifuna by teaching kids. Linguists estimate that one language around the world goes extinct every two weeks, but native speakers like Lovell don't care about the odds. I don't think Garifuna is ever going to die. You see, because those kids are the future, and there are, are a lot of kids out here who they just need to be exposed to it. And I think that's what's pushing me. New York City schools offer classes in 16 different languages. But keeping hundreds of other languages alive depends on people like James Lovell. For 219 West, I'm Jonathan Balthaser.
More and more men these days are using their financial muscle to knock down the stigma associated with skin care and cosmetics. And beauty companies are cashing in on this new market. Uche Abinobi on the men who value their vanity. I like looking young. I like to try to look good and healthy and, you know, reduce wrinkles. I don't like to look like a prune, like I've seen people out there, and I, I don't, that's, yeah. That's why Ivan Rosa goes through his daily routine. Um, pretty much I use the Noxema, or right now I'm using this uh, facial scrub by um, Clinique, and I definitely want to get rid of the oils. My next step would usually be just to moisturize. The 39-year-old high school art teacher is part of that growing market of men, men who are taking steps to combat the effects of aging and to camouflage skin problems. The market research group Euromonitor International reports that U.S. sales of men's beauty products have doubled to $4.7 billion over the past 10 years. I compare myself to other people my age constantly. I hear it, the compliments or whatever, oh, you look so young or you look so good for your age. I'm like, but I'm not that old. At least I don't feel that way. But then I'll meet someone who's my age and I'm thinking, wow, we're the same age? Work on that skin. <laughs> Sorry. Men come to Nikel Spa in Chelsea to do just that. Since opening in 2001, it has catered exclusively to men. Tom Kelly, the director of operations, said that some men are shy when they come in, but that quickly fades. I believe overall men are just wanting to look and feel better about themselves. And when they start to see that these products actually work and can help them feel and look younger, um, that, that's what's driving the market. And guys like Ivan Rosa. As a teen, I went through my acne phase. That was, a, that was more embarrassing. I was like, oh, I gotta oxycute him, you know? But then after that, you go past it. But on days when oxycute him isn't enough, he whips out some cover-up to dab on imperfections. Makeup artist Hawa Abdul says appearing flawless is important. You will find that men want to um, conceal blemishes, so they use a little bit of concealer, take that and maybe put it on a spot or something like that, so it's more like spot healing. A lot of times men want to just kind of just smooth out their complexions. You find a lot of men who wear bronzing powders, so they like to take um, a little bit of bronzing powder and give themselves like a sun-kissed glow. And consumer analysts are expecting to see a boom in the sale of such products. Between 2009 to 2014, the men's care market is expected to grow by 9%. I don't see men afraid to say that they're using a moisturizer. Um, I don't see men afraid to say that they're using a body scrub. You know, if you see commercials now, Axe and all these major brands, you know, they're really trying to push the men's body scrubs. Well, that's just the tip of the iceberg. An iceberg that is centuries old. Men have been using cosmetics for centuries. If you go back to the ancient cultures, to the Greeks, the Romans, and the Egyptians, men quite frequently used a great deal of artifice. And especially among the Greeks, male beauty was prized really beyond female beauty. Today, men are still following in the footsteps of the past and working to preserve their beauty for the future. For 219 West, I'm Uche Abinobi. That's this month's edition of 219 West from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you for watching us. I'm David Montalvo. And I'm Courtney Carter. We'll be back next month with more stories from the five boroughs. In the meantime, don't forget to check out our podcast on iTunes. From all of us at 219 West, Take care and goodbye.